Good morning and welcome to Stonehouse Baptist Church Online. It's Sunday the 4th of October and it is a great pleasure and privilege to welcome you here to share in gathered worship with us. My name is Simon, it's my joy and my honour to minister here at the church and it's my pleasure and privilege as well to be leading us through our worship time this morning. You are welcome here, whoever you are, and it's great to know that you are joining us, that even in these continued times of lockdown, of social distancing, and as coronavirus continues to spread across the world, and we face restrictions and changes to our patterns of life, knowing that we can gather together, knowing that we are united together by the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus and for the sakes of God, is a brilliant, wonderful thing to acknowledge. It's great to know that despite the chaos and the, the tumultuousness and the tempest of things that are going on in the world, that God is eternal, God is everlasting, God is always present, and he overcomes all things. So welcome. Welcome whether you are a regular part of our church family, whether you are a member of our local community, whether you are one of those who's become part of our family by joining us online throughout this time, whether you're here for the first time or whether you're here for the hundredth time. It is great to have you with us. It genuinely is a pleasure. Do say hi in the chat below. Do let us know that you're watching that you're with us. We'd love to be praying alongside and with you and celebrating together this morning. As I say, we've got an act of communion coming up a little bit later on in the service. So if you want to take part in that and everybody who uh, is seeking the love of our Lord Jesus is very welcome to join us for communion. Do have something to eat and something to drink on hand. As we gather together, as we come from very different lives, lives which have perhaps been busy, lives which have perhaps been challenging, lives which have perhaps been a mixture of joy and sorrow. Let's just take a moment or two to quieten our hearts and our minds, to still ourselves and to be ready to encounter God afresh this morning. Lord, we are so thankful. We are so thankful that you have made a way for us to continue gathering together. We are so grateful that the technology exists that means that while we can't be in the same place at the minute, we can still be with one another. We can still be a community. We can still be a fellowship. We can still be your church, Lord. And we ask, Father, that all that we do today is done for your glory and your honour. Help us to remember, Lord, that this is not about us. It's not about our wishes, our wants or our desires, but it's about coming together, recognising who you are, giving glory and honour to your name and worshipping in your throne room. Lord, this is the day you have made and we will rejoice and be glad in it. So help us, Father, to lay down anything that might hamper that happening, anything that gets in the way of us coming to you in fullness and in richness and in truth. Help us to worship with our whole hearts, with our whole minds, with our whole bodies and with every part of our being. For we were made to worship and we come in joy and in gladness to bring our worship to you. We give all the glory all the honour and lift up your name as we bring our praise to you this morning. Our Father in heaven, most mighty, most majestic, most holy of all. Amen. Yeah. 
So let's pray together. Lord, we are thankful. We are so thankful, so grateful for all that you have done in our lives. And as we look back over the moments, the times that we have seen you at work, the times we have felt you at work, the times we have known your hand has been upon us, nudging us, pushing us in the right direction, leading us, guiding us, keeping us safe from harm, we give our thanks to you. We cast our minds back now, Lord, over the week that has just gone. And we identify those moments, those times where your hand has been at work and we give you thanks for them. So let's just take a moment now just to think back on the week that has been and give thanks to God for all that he has done in our lives. Lord, though, we know that we are not always as attentive as we might be. We know that sometimes our pride, our selfishness, our own inwardly gazing natures stop us from seeing your hand at work. And so we ask, Lord, we ask that we would be more aware of you, that we would be more aware of the signs of your kingdom, the signs of your grace, just the signs of your mercy and love at work, not only in our lives, but in the lives of those with whom we come into contact. Father, we pray now for those moments. We pray that our eyes would be opened wider, our hearts would be enlarged, that we would be made more sensitive, more aware of your presence, more aware of your kingdom, seeking that kingdom, seeking those signs in our lives. Oh Lord, we are so grateful. We are so thankful, for we know that we are not worthy of the honour that you give us. We know that we mess up all the time, Lord. We know that we make mistakes. We, we don't do things the way you would have us do them. We don't live our lives the way you ask us to live them. And in these moments, Lord, we confess that. We confess to you that we've messed up. We confess to you that we behaved poorly. We confess that we have spoken badly. We have been angry. We have been selfish. We have been insensitive. Lord, we bring in these moments of quiet our confession to you, either by giving voice aloud or in the quiet of our hearts. Lord, simply saying sorry doesn't seem enough. But we know that you see the truth of our hearts. You see our contrition. You see our sorrow. You see our anguish at the ways in which we have let you down. And you forgive us. You say to us that as far as the east is from the west, so far have you removed our sin from us. That in Jesus you have made us clean. You have wiped us clean of our wrongdoing. And we... Lord, bask in the glory and the wonder of that truth. We hold on to it and we grasp it firm and hold it to ourselves. And we know that for those who are in Jesus Christ, there is no condemnation. So Lord, help us. Help us to live lives that are stronger, that are more firm, that are more convicted for you. Lives which reflect your glory, which reflect your honour, which reflect the amazing truth that you have been at work and you are at work in us, through us and into the world around us. Help us to lay down the things that get in the way. Help us to lay down our selfishness, our pride, our arrogance. Help us to lay down the hurt that we have felt and help us to make amends for the hurt that we have caused. Lord, we give ourselves to you again this morning. We give ourselves to you anew and we say, make us, Lord, better in your image, more like your son, Jesus Christ. For we pray this in his mighty name. And we say now the words of the prayer that he taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. 
Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. The word peace is common in most languages. People can talk about peace treaties or times of peace. It means the absence of war. And in the Bible, the word peace can refer to the absence of conflict, but it also points to the presence of something better in its place. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew word for peace is shalom. And in the New Testament, the Greek word is erene. The most basic meaning of shalom is complete or whole. The word can refer to a stone that has a perfect whole shape with no cracks. It can also refer to a completed stone wall that has no gaps and no missing bricks. Shalom refers to something that's complex with lots of pieces that's in a state of completeness, wholeness. It's like Job who says his tents are in a state of shalom because he counted his flock and no animals are missing. This is why shalom can refer to a person's well-being. Like when David visited his brothers on the battlefield, he asked about their shalom. The core idea is that life is complex, full of moving parts and relationships and situations. And when any of these is out of alignment or missing, your shalom breaks down. Life is no longer whole. It needs to be restored. In fact, that's the basic meaning of shalom when you use it as a verb. To bring shalom literally means to make complete or restore. So Solomon brings shalom to the unfinished temple when he completes it. Or if your animal accidentally damages your neighbor's field, you shalom them by giving them a complete repayment for their loss. You take what's missing and you restore it to wholeness. The same goes for human relationships. In the book of Proverbs, to reconcile and heal a broken relationship is to bring shalom. And when rival kingdoms make shalom in the Bible, it doesn't just mean they stop fighting, it also means they start working together for each other's benefit. This state of shalom is what Israel's kings were supposed to cultivate and it rarely happened. So the prophet Isaiah, he looked forward to a future king, a prince of shalom, and his reign would bring shalom with no end. A time when God would make a covenant of shalom with his people and make right all wrongs and heal all that's been broken. This is why Jesus' birth in the New Testament was announced as the arrival of Irene. Remember, that's the Greek word for peace. Jesus came to offer his peace to others, like when he said to his followers, my peace I give to you all. The apostles claimed that Jesus made peace between messed up humans and God when he died and rose from the dead. The idea is that he restored to wholeness the broken relationship between humans and their creator. This is why the Apostle Paul can say Jesus himself is our Irene. He was the whole complete human that I am made to be but have failed to be. And now he gives me his life as a gift. And this means that Jesus' followers are now called to create peace. Paul instructed local churches to keep their unity through the bond of peace, which requires humility and patience and bearing with others in love. Becoming people of peace means participating in the life of Jesus, who reconciled all things in heaven on earth, restoring peace through his death and resurrection. So peace takes a lot of work because it's not just the absence of conflict. True peace requires taking what's broken and restoring it to wholeness, whether it's in our lives, our relationships, or in our world. And that's the rich biblical concept of peace. Surround.
I read a story recently about a submarine that prior to being deployed into active service was being tested and as part of this test it had to remain submerged for many hours in the deeper ocean. When it returned to the harbour the captain was asked how did that terrible storm last night affect you? The officer looked at the dock hand who had asked this question and was surprised and puzzled and said storm? What storm? We didn't even know there was one. You see, the sub had reached a point so far beneath the surface of the sea that it had come to the area that sailors call the cushion of the sea. At that depth, the submarine and her crew were completely unaware of the storm that had happened on the surface. The torrential rains, the howling winds, the turbulent seas experienced by others hadn't touched them. Though the world around had been in complete chaos, their experience was, in contrast, one of utter peace. I wonder what you think of when you hear the word peace. Perhaps the images that your mind conjures up are of tranquil meadows, blue skies and a gentle breeze rustling the branches of a sturdy old English oak tree. Perhaps the beach at sunset as the warm waves serenely ebb and flow over golden sands. Perhaps you picture a scene of complete tranquility, where all is right and all is well with the world, where trouble and strife are non-existent, where conflict and stress are completely lacking. Peace, as the great Roman writer Marcus Tullius Cicero wrote, is liberty in tranquility. And yet, as we look to the world around us, as we face the daily realities in which we live, peace can seem little more than a pipe dream. It's a nice concept, sure, but an elusive reality ever slipping through our grasp and evading our well-meaning attempts to bring it into being. Perhaps we have that picture of tranquility, that desire to achieve this peace, but the way things actually are, day to day, frustrates and denies this realisation. A few years ago, a group of scholars uh, surveyed history and revealed that in the last three and a half thousand-ish years of recorded human history, there have been only about 280 years where there wasn't a conflict of any kind in the world. 280 years out of three and a half thousand. How then, in the midst of such turmoil, of such turbulence, can we ever hope to find peace? The blessing that God bestows upon his people, however, 
is a promise of peace, a promise of shalom, which extends beyond the external situations and circumstances. It's a peace which, in the words of the Apostle Paul to the church at Philippi, surpasses all understanding. God's peace, as the priestly blessing that we are thinking of offers it, is not limited by human finitude, but exists in spite of the unrest, in spite of the disorder around us. This blessing is for us to know the peace of God in our inmost being, for the security which comes from knowing who ultimately controls the forces of the world. This is peace, the peace that God desires for his people, and it is far more, we will discover, than a cessation of hostility, but in fact a fullness of life and living, a rich abundance of completeness, of unity, of well-being, of security, of wholeness. And the good news is that it is not dependent on external factors or upon us, but upon the internal relationship that we have with God through Jesus. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. As we reach the end of the blessing that God has given to the priests of Israel, we see the culmination of all that has gone before. The crescendo that has been building as God has acted towards humanity reaches its climax. And we see revealed in these beautiful, beautiful words, the deepest desires of the father's heart for his creation. It's all been building to this. God's blessing pouring out from him. God's blessing keeping the people. God's face turned towards us as his mercy and his kindness are demonstrated in his graciousness towards humanity. And this all builds to this moment, the ultimate promise of God, his greatest blessing. God's glorious will for humanity is declared in no uncertain terms. His desire, his blessing, his will is to give his peace. Now, if you've got a Bible to hand, or if you're accessing our text this morning online, on a mobile device, or in some other way, it would be fantastic to turn to the book of Numbers, chapter 6. We're being in verses uh, 22 to 27, mostly in 26 again this morning. And as you turn to that, Barbara has very, very kindly brought our reading to us today. The reading is from number 6. 22 to 27. The Priestly Blessing. The Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron and his sons, This is how you are to bless the Israelites. Say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. So they will put my name on the Israelites, and I will bless them. Let's pray. Lord, as we seek to hear your voice this morning, would you still the disquiet of our hearts? Would you calm our anxieties? Would you remove from us any distraction from the outside world or from our inner thoughts that takes us away from you? We ask Lord, that we would be given open ears, open hearts and open minds to hear your Holy Spirit as you speak to us words of affirmation, of life, of encouragement, words that you wish us to hear, to take and to dwell upon as you dwell within our hearts and minds this morning. So lead us, Lord, in the path of understanding, of rightness with you. We pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. So what is peace? Now, I don't often do the old public speaking trick of saying Webster's Dictionary defines, but in this case, Webster's Dictionary defines peace most frequently as a freedom from external factors. So a freedom from civil disturbance, freedom from oppression, freedom from disquieting thoughts and emotions. Our own definitions of peace may well equally be focused on a cessation of its external difficulties leading to an outer environment of calm and stillness. And none of these definitions is inherently bad. None of them are wrong. 
and certainly the sentiments that we have when we express our desire for peace, that, that old cliché of Miss World pageants where every contestant's greatest desire is absolutely for world peace. Do you know, this is laudable. In fact, I would go so far as to say that it is completely vital and central to our understanding of who we are as followers of Jesus. But the other reality that we face is we cannot be peacemakers, as Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers. We cannot be peacemakers bringing peace to the world, bringing peace into other situations until we have that peace ourselves. Peace with Christ. Peace with God through Christ. Peace of knowing and understanding who and whose we are. So what? What if we started to reorientate our thinking somewhat? What if, as we strive to be people of peace in the worldly realm, and again, we really should be doing that, what if we start to understand that the peace of God, this shalom to which the priestly blessing has been building, isn't the absence of outward difficulties and issues, but the presence of God in our lives? The Bible presents us with so many glorious pictures of God's peace. And the most important, I believe, are peace as it was experienced at creation and as it will be in new creation. At the very start and at the very end of God's story, of God's plan for his creation, he is present. And in his presence, there is peace. God is with his people. He walks with them and they dwell in his presence. The beauty of the imagery that we have of Eden and of new creation are realities which we confess. We say this is the way the world as it once was and this is the way the world will one day be. But at the minute we live in between those times. We are those who are in the intervening spaces, in the story that is still unfolding but hasn't reached its final conclusion. We are somewhere between the perfection of Eden and the transcendent fulfilment of new Jerusalem. So our quest for peace is of a different kind. How can we experience this shalom in the midst of a world which is full of turmoil, full of brokenness, full of imperfection? Adrian Rogers, an American preacher and author, once said this, peace is not the subtraction of problems, but the addition of power to face and overcome them. And the source of that power is all important. The world is intent on selling us peace. The world is intent on selling us peace and does it through all manner of means. But God offers us something different. God's peace is not something we buy into, but a freely given gift through his son Jesus. Hear these words from John, chapter 14, verse 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Now in this passage, Jesus is preparing his disciples for his impending arrest, his death, his resurrection and ultimately his ascension to heaven. And as he does so, he makes this promise, this astonishing promise. He will leave his peace, which is nothing like that of the world, with the disciples. See, this is a different kind of peace. This is found through the presence of God given to us through Christ in the form of the Holy Spirit, who dwells in the hearts of all who come to God in faith through Christ. This is the peace of God, not bought about by an external factor, not bought and sold like a commodity on the open market, but the peace of God made real through his very presence in our lives. Eugene Peterson's paraphrase of the Bible, the message, uses a recurring image of the Holy Spirit as taking up residence, of moving into the lives of those who believe in Christ and are saved by that belief. And this is the source of God's peace in our lives, the shalom, the wholeness, the fullness that is promised. This is what Jesus means when in John 10, 10, he says, I have come that they may have life 
and have it to the full. God's desire, you see, is for his people to have that in our lives, that regardless of circumstances, regardless of the places in which we find ourselves, the things that are going on around us, regardless of the difficulties, regardless of the storms and the tempests of life, that we have peace with God because God's presence dwells in and with us through his Holy Spirit. It's the peace that we are given by God through Christ because we are justified through Christ back to God. The world says to us that peace can and will only come when conflict is ended, but Jesus' promise to us is this, peace in the middle of conflict. This is a peace that, like the cushion of the ocean, is so deep that no matter the storm that rages above and around, there is calm, there is still, there is a peace that God offers us that the world cannot possibly offer us. Calmness in the midst of chaos, security in the face of disorder, wholeness in a world torn apart and filled with brokenness. Once long ago, a man sought the perfect picture of peace and not finding one that satisfied, he announced a contest to produce this masterpiece. The challenge stirred the imagination of artists everywhere and paintings arrived from far and wide. Finally, the great day of revelation arrived. The judges uncovered one peaceful scene after another, while the viewers clapped and cheered at the beauty on display. Tension grew, for only two pictures remained veiled. As a judge pulled the cover from one, a hush fell over the crowd. A mirror-smooth lake reflected lacy green birches under the soft blush of evening sky. Along the grassy shore, a flock of sheep grazed undisturbed. Surely this was the winner. However, the second painting was uncovered and a man with vision saw it and the crowd gasped in surprise. Could this be peace? A tumultuous waterfall cascaded down a rocky precipice and the crowd could feel its cold, penetrating spray. Stormy grey clouds threatened to explode with lightning. Wind and rain lashed across the sky. And in the midst of the thundering noises, a bitter chill, a spin spindly tree clung to the rocks at the edge of the falls. One of its branches reached out in front of torrential waters as if foolishly seeking to experience the full power of the torrent that was flowing. And in that branch, a bird had built a nest in the elbow of the tree. Content and undisturbed in her stormy surroundings, she rested on her eggs. With her eyes closed and her wings ready to cover her offspring, she manifested peace that transcends all earthly turmoil. This is the peace that Jesus brings us. This is the peace that God wants for us. Peace that is brought about and found in his presence. In the presence of God who takes up residence, who dwells within us through his spirit. This is a peace then that is unmoved by the changeability of the world. A peace which is unaffected by the tumult, by the torrent this is the peace that God is bringing us through his blessing. The peace that God promises, the peace that God promises his people is a peace which brings contentment regardless of circumstance. This is contentment based on the knowledge and the truth that God is everlasting and never changing. The reality is that when we seek our peace in the things of the world, when we build our lives and when we place our hopes on things which are at best temporary, fleeting, changeable and easy to lose, we are building on an insecure foundation. When our hunger is for things of worldly origin, for possessions, for recognition, for wealth, when we seek our peace and fulfilment in these things, we may well find satisfaction for a while. We may well find contentment for a while. We may well achieve some sense of peace 
for a while. But these satisfactions, this contentment, this comfort will be shallow and short. For the things of the world are temporary. They are fleeting and they pass us by in moments. Yet the things of God, the comfort that God offers, the peace that God brings is eternal and unfailing. Moth and rust cannot destroy what God promises. Thief and vandal cannot steal or destroy. For God's promise of peace is one which depends not on our human ability, not on our strength, not on our will, but on him, on his divine nature. Peace is not a process. It is not a product, but the outworking of a relationship that we have. It is God's power. God's power to live above and beyond the storms and trials of the world and to bring us through those storms and trials as he works through us, as he works into us by his Holy Spirit. What is peace? It's us. It's us living in the constant flow of God's grace. It's us knowing that though we did not earn it, though we could not work for it, though we do not deserve it, God has purchased our redemption. God has bought and brought us back. It's the knowledge that through his self-giving sacrifice on the cross at Golgotha, Jesus' death won the decisive victory over the forces of chaos and destruction and made a way for God's peace, God's shalom, to work into and through the lives of those who believe in him. God's peace is the inevitable consequence of God's grace. And peace is God's promise for us. It was God's plan and his pattern at the beginning and it will be the reality in which we live in the final and everlasting days. Adam and Eve walked with God in the cool shade of the evening in Eden. His presence was with them. God dwelt amongst his people and they knew peace. And friends, this is how things will be again. This is the kingdom that was inaugurated in Christ and which the promise of God is for all his people. In John's vision, we read these words. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning, or crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. A picture of perfect and glorious peace, of God once more living amongst his people, dwelling in creation, a place where there is no conflict or chaos, where there is no death or mourning, where there is no crying or pain, a place of liberty in tranquility, where all trouble has been overcome and shalom is not only the promise but the reality in which we live. Cornelius Plantinga Jr. says this of God's shalom. The webbing together of God, humans and all creation in justice, fulfilment and delight is what the Hebrew prophets call shalom. We call it peace but it means far more than mere peace of mind or a ceasefire between enemies. In the Bible, shalom means universal flourishing, wholeness and delight. Shalom, in other ways, in other words, is the way things ought to be. God's peace is the way things ought to be and God's peace is the promise that we have. Until that time comes, until we have the perfect peace of eternity in God's presence, we turn our faith towards our loving Father in heaven and we seek his presence through his Holy Spirit. We seek the power that is at work within us that brings wholeness, that brings comfort, that brings joy and security and ultimately brings us freedom. So how are we doing with living that in our lives right now? 
How are we doing at understanding that our peace does not come from external situation and circumstance, but instead from our internal relationship with our Heavenly Father, whose greatest desire is to give us peace. Peace is God's greatest gift and his ultimate blessing for his people. If you are here this morning, if you are tuning in and you do not know that peace, that peace that surpasses all understanding, you do not know the comfort and the joy and the security and the wholeness of being with God, then I implore you, reach out. Reach out to him in prayer. Reach out to him and ask him. For he desires to give you that peace. He desires to bring you that wholeness. He desires for you to come back to him. He desires to be in relationship with you, to dwell in your hearts and for you to dwell in his presence in the same way. It's not too late. It's never too late. The time is right. The time is now. Friends, we live in a world that seems to become more and more chaotic, more and more turbulent, more and more broken by every passing day. And yet, those who believe in Jesus, those who have faith, those who have been restored to God by their profession of faith, by his grace, we have peace. We have the promise of God's shalom. And we have the Holy Spirit who accompanies us and who brings us that peace into our lives. So this morning, this morning, grasp that peace. This morning, know that your peace, your provision, your wholeness, your fullness of being does not come from circumstances that are outside, but from the indwelling presence of God in your hearts and in your lives. He reaches towards you and offers this peace to you freely at no cost and for all time. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. Man of sorrows, then my God, by his own. Jesus spilled 
Now the curse of sin has no hold on me. The sun sets free, oh, it's free indeed. Now my debt is paid. It is paid in full by the precious blood that my Jesus spilled. Now the curse of sin. And so we come to a time of communion, where we gather in our own homes, around our own tables, united with one another by the Spirit, and sharing in the feast at the banquet of the King. We remember, we celebrate, and we honour the life, the death and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus in these moments. If you have something to eat and something to drink, do please have that to hand and be ready to take that at the appropriate moment in the act. This is the table of the Lord, and we are gathered to his supper with a foretaste of all things that are promised. So come when you are fearful to be made new in love. Come when you are doubtful to be made strong in faith. Come when you are regretful to be made whole. Come old and young, for there is room for all. The kingdom of God is justice and peace. So let us then pursue those things which make for peace. Where lies abound, may we be caused to speak truth. Where greed takes all, may we be caused to act justly. Where violence consumes, may we be caused to live in peace. Where death mocks us, may we know that we live in Christ. We set aside our own wisdom, our will, our words. We empty our hearts, bringing nothing in our hands, yearning for the healing, the holding, the accepting and the forgiving which Christ alone can offer. So may the peace of the Lord rest within us and remain with us today and always. We know that Christ's first commandment to us was to love the Lord our God with all our soul, all our mind, all our heart and all our body. Yet we also know that we are weak and have not done so. In these moments, therefore, let us bring our confession of those times where we have failed to live in this commandment. The second commandment that Jesus gave was to love our neighbours as ourselves. And we confess now that we have not always lived in this way. Let us take these moments to bring that confession to our Lord God.
we know that the Lord is just and merciful, that his grace and kindness means that for those who come in confession with truly repentant hearts, he wipes clean the stain of sin. For as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgression from us. Let us commit now to live our lives in the fullness of that truth, giving thanks to God that we have been forgiven, giving praise and worship to God that we live in the restoration of Christ's sacrifice for us. The tradition which I hand on to you comes from the Lord himself. For on the night of his arrest, Jesus took bread. He gave thanks to God and he broke it, saying, this is my body, which is for you. Do this and remember me. For the bread that we eat daily, God be blessed forever. For the bread of the great day that feeds us for new life, God be blessed forever. Jesus, true and living bread, touch all our days and fit us for your new day's dawning. Nourish us with bread for the journey, disciples in your way, this day and always. We take bread now, breaking it and giving thanks Feasting on it in our hearts with thanksgiving, remembering that Christ's body was given for us. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for the forgiveness of your sins. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. For the wine that makes hearts glad, God be praised forever. For the wine that seals the covenant, God be praised forever. Jesus, true and living vine, make hearts glad and lives safe. Enliven us with the wine of the kingdom this day and always. Friends, I invite you to take the cup and let us share this together. Sign and symbol of Jesus' blood which was shed for the forgiveness of our sins and a sign of our commitment to one another as Christ's church here in this place at this time. Let's drink. Dying, you destroyed our death. Rising, you restored our life. Come, Lord Jesus, again in glory. Loving God, we thank you that you have nourished us at our table. We pray for those who hunger and thirst. May they be filled and may we with them feast at the table of your eternal kingdom. This we ask through Jesus Christ, who was and is and is to come and who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, for ever and ever.
Thank you so much for joining us this morning. I pray that you have been encouraged. I pray that you have been blessed. I pray that maybe you've been challenged and stretched a little. And I would love to hear how God has been at work in your lives, how you have reacted and responded to this morning's time of worship. So if you'd like to reach out to us, we'd love to hear from you. You can do that in a number of ways and that information should be popping up across the bottom of your screen right now. So we're on the web at www.stonehousebaptist.org.uk. You can email us uh, general church email, which is contact at stonehousebaptist.org.uk, or you can email me directly on minister at stonehousebaptist.org.uk. Some of you are watching this already on Facebook. If you're not and you'd like to join us over there, it's facebook.com forward slash stonehousebaptist. And if you're on YouTube, why not subscribe and hit the like so that you can keep up to date with the latest news from us. Friends, we are now on several other forms of social media and we'd love it if you've gave us a follow over on Instagram. You can find us at Instagram at Stonehouse Baptist Church. We're also tweeting regularly, so you can follow us there at SBC underscore Baptist. And of course, we are delighted to hear from you at all times. We want to share in your joys and we want to pray with and for you in your struggles and in your sorrows. It's been great, great to be with you. And I pray that the week that lies ahead will be full of God's blessing and God's grace and God's peace in your life. Do join us next week if you're able. We start a whole new series looking at everyday Jesus, how we can worship and praise and experience Jesus in our day to day lives. And next week is uh, kicking off with looking at everyday prayer. And it's a great pleasure to be able to welcome Emily Twig, who is going to be speaking and sharing with us during that time. In the meantime, it is just down to me, my great pleasure and privilege to bless you on your way. In a moment, we're going to share in the song, the blessing that we've had the last couple of weeks. And I invite you to sing that at home or, or to receive that as a prayer. But I just want to close by reading these magnificent words that we've spent the last three weeks thinking about. So friends, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. Oh
Children and their children and their children. May his prayer.